goal today is to try my best to inspire you to understand the significance of what Jesus Christ has done in your life. Amen. And I wanted you to get to the place in your life to where you look forward to worshiping Jesus Christ every moment of your life. Amen. Amen. So hopefully today we will be able to see exactly what Jesus has done for humanity, what He's done for you, and uh, hopefully inspire you to give Him all the glory and all the praise that He deserves. Amen. We're going to start in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah chapter... Nine, I believe. In fact, I misplaced my other Bible. There it is right there. This is a good Bible, but this Bible is way faster. So if you're trying to find something and you want to find it real fast, I suggest you get this. All right. Isaiah chapter 9. Did I say that? Isaiah chapter 9, it talks about a Savior that will come upon this planet one day. And I wanted to say, look, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This is talking about the eventual birth of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now, I believe that this is a, maybe 800 years before Jesus was even born. Maybe not quite 800 years, but uh, maybe um, give or take, right? Amen. So he's, uh, this again, this prophet is saying that Jesus, there's going to be a child that's going to be born, and it says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, uh, and his name shall be called, look at this, what's his name going to be called? Wonderful, yeah. Counselor, the Mighty God. Think of this, the mighty God. Amen. Now this says that there's going to be a child born, a son that will be given, and this son will be called the mighty God. Amen. It's so, so phenomenal to think that our God was born into this world. Amen. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, but this is the word I want you to look at, or the, the, the title, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Yes. The Prince of Peace. It is, it is remarkable when you think about the Prince of Peace. Well, what, what, what do you mean peace? It seems like that this world still seems to be going crazy. Right. Even after this, there's, there's been wars and wars and wars and wars. But that's not what the Prince of Peace was here to do. Which is what... The Israelites, or the you know the uh, the Jewish people, were looking for their Messiah to do was to bring peace upon the planet. So therefore, there would be no more wars. And then, obviously, they were pretty self-centered, and they were thinking, "And we will reign supreme over yeah. the whole world." Right? See how that worked out. That's what they were looking for. But this Prince of Peace was not in the business of making so much world peace, but he was in the business of making peace with mankind because they were sinful. And God was a holy God. And God says that I will in no wise allow the guilty to go unpunished, meaning that He will punish sin. Now, if God is a righteous God, now we know that God is love, right? Yeah, yeah. God is love, but God also is a just God. Yeah. And if He made the rules, and the rules state, what? The law of sin and death. Yeah. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's just the rules. That's the rules that we all play by. You might not like the rules, but simply because you might not like the rules doesn't mean that your opinion overrules God's rules. Amen. Amen. It's still the Word. It's still true. And this is how we are supposed to govern ourselves Amen. based upon His Word. So His Word has tons and tons of laws. So therefore, we know that we have broken God's laws many times. 
So, if there's enmity between us and God, that means that someone has to be the peacemaker. Right. Amen. You see, He's the Prince of Peace. Amen. He comes in and makes us and God have peace between us. That's just what that means. And so let's look into the New Testament. Let's go over to, um, I believe, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 5. That's what I meant. Romans chapter 5. Hopefully this is easy for you to find. And again, I, if you don't have a Bible, I'm sorry. Uh, there may be some Bibles there in the middle. However... I'm going to read it anyway because the Word of God is a lot better than my delivery. Amen. Thank you. I knew I had some critics out there. Sorry, I dropped my page. Thank you for not aiming him. At least I had two people that didn't aim him. Romans chapter 5. Watch what Jesus does. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right? Amen. It's, so we have peace between us and God. God says He's going to punish sin, but because of Jesus, there's a peace treaty. Right. <laughs> and the peace treaty is offered here through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And this is what it says. This is how it happens. Verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into His grace. grace. So he's saying we have access to be with God. And God is eternal. Amen. We could never be in the presence of eternity or God unless we have faith. How, what, what do we have to have faith in? We have to have faith that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Amen. We have to have faith that Jesus paid the sin debt for us. Amen. Because there is, again, that law, the soul that sins it shall die. Jesus comes and He gives us access to God by our faith into God's grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Amen. Does that make you want to sing another praise song? Amen. It makes me want to sing another praise song. Thank you, Lord. What, what is it? You should, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so patient and free. Amen. You're all the same. <laughs> beautiful. Yes. It's all from God. It's all from God. So, if we are now able to have peace between us and God, it should make us feel a little invincible, doesn't it? Just think, because I mean, what, what, do, what, what are you going to do to me? But still we live in a world to where we have troubles and trials and tribulation. Right. Anybody here have a perfect life to where they've never had one single worry or no, no trouble in their life? No. If you have lived that life, this is the wrong church for you. Because <laughs> 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 you probably broke the ninth commandment. <laughs> Everybody has troubles and trials. So what, what happens? If we have peace with God... We should, again, feel like that every day she seems to should, should go perfectly fine. But in the event that you are still here on earth and you actually have a rational mind, verse 3 comes into play. And not only so, but we glory in what? Glory in tribulation? So that means that we're supposed to like say, Woo! Yes! Things are going bad. <laughs> and if you think that it doesn't say that or mean that, then you're wrong. It really means that. Then you're supposed to glory in tribulation. Now, it is true that I've tried that a few times to whenever things were really going bad. 
And so I just decided that I'm praising the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. I'm walking around praising the Lord. <coughs> praise the Lord. I actually praised the Lord so much I forgot about my trials and tribulations. Right. I really did. Yeah, that's, that's what He wants us to do. Right. Think about the good stuff. That's why He writes in the Scripture. Amen. Think on these things. If Amen. there would be anything wholesome, if there be anything true or pure, think on these things. But this says, but we glory in tribulations also. Why would we do that? Because it says this, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Yes. Well, praise God. Yes. Praise God. Have you ever had a child? <laughs> or a grandchild? Or even the neighbor's kids? Right. You, know? <laughs> you see, tribulations bring about patience. And patience brings about experience. Yeah. That's why Rehoboam messed up. You see, Rehoboam did not take the advice of the council of the elders. Amen. He took advice from the young men, not the elders. The young men, most of the time, maybe perhaps you know this, they don't know very much. No. <laughs> but they think they do. Right. You see, the people who have been through this life for many years have a lot of experience. Right. That doesn't mean they're perfect. But actually, if they're not perfect, they've learned a hard lesson. And they want to pass that along to you. So think of it. And not only so we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation work in patience and patience experience and experience hope. Oh. hope. Well, we have a great hope. It's not that we don't have faith. It's just that faith and hope are really close to each other. There's a thin line. But see, our hope isn't that we hope for something. Our hope is the fact that this is our only hope. Amen. Amen. Jesus is your only hope Amen. to have peace with God. So it, 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 it goes just like that. You've got, you've got a glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation works with patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Well, hope is Jesus. He is our hope. Amen. And verse 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Amen. So think of it. This is saying that God's Spirit is now able to give you a spiritual life. Amen. You can't see your spiritual life. That's you. I don't think so. Because you can't really see the spiritual world at all. God didn't make our eyes able to see the eternal realm. Amen. But God is going to allow the Spirit of God to be inside of us or in our being, causing us to have a separate being. One of the flesh, one of the Spirit. Now this is deep. And so it says, in our hearts, by the Holy Ghost which is given to us, verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. <coughs> yeah. There are certain people who believe that Jesus on the cross only died for the elect. <coughs> this says that He died Everyone. for the ungodly. That means everybody. Amen. He died for the ungodly. And that means this. He didn't go and play favorites and say, well, I kind of like these people, so I want them to be saved because I don't want to be in heaven with those people. Because if that would be the case, would not that be the most kind of difficult thing to hear? That God did not even give you a chance at salvation? Amen. That you weren't the elect, you weren't the chosen, so therefore you can't make it? How horrible! How horrible would that be for a person to hear that? That's not of the Scripture. This is of the Scripture. Verse 7, For scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet, preventure, for a good man some would even dare to die. And this is interesting, isn't it? Amen. Would you lay your life down for your family? Amen. Amen. Because I love them, and they're mine. 
Would you lay, lay your life down for your child? Your grandchild? Would you do that? Would you step in front of that one? Well, you know what? So that would be laying your life down for someone that you love, a good person, someone you really love, but maybe just kind of an okay person. I mean, it's just like you've seen people do that. The military, they sign up and they're willing to go and fight for the government, for, for their family, for their homeland. So, but this is verse 8. But God commendeth His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means that you did not deserve. You didn't deserve this. You were a sinner. And what happens with people who are sinners? That, that, that creates a chasm between you and God. Because God does not like sin, neither will He share space with sin. He doesn't want to be around sin, but yet He loved us so much that He paid the penalty for our sin while we were still sinners, planning on offering us an opportunity of redemption. Verse 9, yeah. much more being, much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. Now think of it, in Isaiah, he said he will be the Prince of Peace. Amen. Now you understand, he made peace between us and God. Amen. He's the greatest peacemaker that ever existed. Amen. It says, verse 10, for if, we, for if when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God, by the death of His Son. <laughs> if you were living in sin, you are an enemy of God. You were an enemy of God. Amen. But God made us an opportunity to join His side. Now think of it, an enemy of God, if we fully surrender. You see? We have to fully surrender to God so that Jesus, Jesus will allow the Holy Spirit to come into us and fill us with God's presence. Yes. But without God being the mediator, enemies of God, He's the peacemaker. He steps in between God and man and says, I'm going to make this good between them and you. Right. They're willing to surrender. If they're willing to surrender their all, they get to be with God. Is this exciting? Amen. And maybe I'm hoping that you aren't so excited right now because you just can't wait to sing a song that praise God. <laughs> so start getting excited about it. It says, it says again, verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by Jesus' life. Yes. Right. 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. The atonement. This is beautiful. I mean, think of whenever you see the atonement. I mean, think of the fact that Maybe someone came in and paid the ransom for your crime. You see? Amen. He gave you the ultimate gift. Amen. And that is He paid your sin debt. Amen. So that you will no longer have, again, the punishment for your sins to fall upon you. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and who was that? Eve. Oh, no, I'm sorry. By one man sin had entered into the world, and what's that name? Adam. Adam. I've actually heard some people say, well, uh, women can't be in ministry because, uh, because Eve was the one that screwed up. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Lord forgive me. Messed up the world. Has anybody ever heard that? I've heard that. That a woman messed up the world? No. This says 
Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that means two, Adam. And it says, and death and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have what? Sin. Everybody has sinned. Amen. There is no one who is exempt from the penalty of death other than through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ who made the atonement for your sin. That means that He gave a gift. His gift was to allow you to receive redemption from that sin. So therefore, one more verse. Romans chapter 12. One more verse, a few more verses in Romans chapter 12. I don't know if you all remember this, but whenever we had the service, I asked everybody to go on and read Romans chapter 12. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to raise your hand if you didn't read Romans chapter 12, verse 1. But if you did, then praise the Lord. You're going to read it again. Romans chapter 1. Think of this. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And the reason why I say this is because uh, years ago, I was in church and I kept telling everybody, read you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And so I kept reading it and I kept preaching. I was just preaching, preaching, preaching. And everybody in the whole sanctuary kept looking at me like, well, like some of you do. So. Thank you. And oh man, I was getting a so... I was getting so filled with the Holy Ghost and I was on fire and I kept looking in the whole sanctuary. And they were looking at each other and I was like, do you not understand this? <laughs> then after the church service, somebody said, you were reading from 1 Corinthians and you told us 2 Corinthians. <laughs> that was the only mistake I've ever made from the Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry. Except for that one. I just now vain jested. I shouldn't have done that either. But here's the, here's the, that's why I repeat the scripture. So, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. This is written to the people who were at Rome. And this is also a wonderful letter that can be written to every one of us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren and sisters, <laughs> brothers and sisters, <coughs> By the miracles of God, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Okay. Jesus came here. He sacrificed His body and died for you. Amen. So that you can live for Him. Yeah. Humongous, isn't it? Now how many of us really live for God? How many of us have fully decided that I'm going to sacrifice my wants for His wants? Everything that we should do in our life once Jesus Christ, once we understand what Jesus Christ has done, it should make us totally want to sacrifice our living body. Not so that we could die to, for God, but so that we could live for God. Yeah. And, that, and, and so listen to how it says... It says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So I'm asking you this. Will you live for God? Yes. Will you live for Jesus Christ? Yes. Will you think of everything that the world has to offer and realize that it is temporal, it is temporary, it will all one day be burned up? It's true. Your home one day will fall apart. Yes. Well, I hope I'm not. It already is. That was great. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> Tribulation work of patience. <laughs> patience work. So you see, 
No matter what you invest in, one day you'll realize it's worthless. If you store up treasures here on earth, certainly I'm not advocating that everybody go out and completely just be broken. That might do some of us good. Get to the point to where we have nothing except for Jesus. I don't know because, praise the Lord, I was born way after the 40s and the 50s. Way after. What's that? Amen. Thank you. But you know, a lot of people have told me that things were really bad. Things were really hard. You know, I think that we now live in a day and age to where it seems like that we do whatever we want. No joke. We eat whatever we want. Amen. We just decide, hey, I, I, I think I want to eat a pizza. You go get a pizza. You know, there's been times to whenever I was younger to where we just didn't we didn't have an option. You know, we didn't have an option. If you if you grew up in a pastor's home, maybe you, maybe you'd understand. Sometimes we didn't have an option. We got and ate whatever we had. And again, you know what it is. You know how Mama would say, "You eat what's on your plate." Like not Brussels sprouts. You know. What I mean? But you know, we do live in a day and age to where we eat whatever we want. We go wherever we want. So most of us, we just kind of order whatever we want. We get whatever we want. And if we don't even have enough money, we just put it on the credit card. So we get whatever we want. Amen. I mean, are we blessed? Or, yeah, we're blessed. But you know, the church in Laodicea, they said the same thing to God. They said, we are in need of nothing. We have everything we want. And then God says, you don't realize this. You think you get everything you want, but really you're blind, naked, and poor. Amen. Without Jesus Christ, we're blind, naked, and poor. Amen. And the rest of this world, I believe, they're so spoiled with all of the luxuries of the things here on earth, they forget that one day there's going to be a reckoning. Amen. And they had better have Jesus Christ as their Prince of Peace because God is not going to be merciful to those who have disregarded His Son Jesus' sacrifice. Amen. I would be very upset if my child came here, died for your sins, and you rejected Him your whole life. Yes. I would be very upset. Don't you see what I've given you? How many times have you said that to your kids whenever they were missing out of there? Uh, I want this, I want this. Everybody else's kids get to do this, but why can't I? And you're like, do you realize how great you have it? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what's going to happen on Judgment Day? Do you realize the gift of Jesus Christ that you've rejected? But for us, for us, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Think of it. He's saying that you should, you should be a living sacrifice. You should be holy. Why does it say that? Does it say that because holiness is going to get you to heaven? It says it because this. If Jesus Christ is in you and you've sanctified your life to live for Jesus Christ, that you will live a holy life. Amen. And if you're not living a holy life, that Jesus Christ will let you know every time you foul up. Amen. It's true. I did that, I did that the, just this past year. I renewed my covenant with the Lord. And this is what I pray. This is, I, I just want everybody to think about this. Ask Jesus, ask the Spirit of God to let you know every time that you commit a sin. You know, I'll tell you, He answered my prayer. And I, I, I spend most of my time repenting. And you're like, well, you don't have to repent because Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. No, I don't have to repent. I need to repent Amen. because I love Jesus Christ so much. Amen. I love Him so much for what He's done that I do not want to bring Him dishonor. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, look at what we just read here today. Does this not inspire you to give Him your all? 
that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Now look at look at what this says. Which is your reasonable It's only reasonable. <laughs> I mean, I love that. This is just only reasonable that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. I mean, it's only just the expectation. I just expect you to do that. Why should you have to have a preacher yell at you all the time? Say, yeah. No, I just, I just expect you to be holy. I expect you to live, uh, uh, surrender your life fully to Jesus Christ. I expect you to live your life that would be acceptable for God on His terms. Yes. That's the only reason. So this is telling us why we should do what we need to do. And we know that we need to do it because Jesus Christ is our Prince of Peace. Verse 2, And be not conformed unto this world. Now, I'm going to set, set us up just for a moment. Everybody pay really close attention because this is our last verse, all right? I'm going to set everybody up here because at the very end, it's almost a rhetorical question at the very end. So don't read it ahead of time. So be not conformed unto this world. So what does that mean? What does conform mean? Be like the world. Be like everybody else. You know, I don't know how many of you people, uh, how many of you have lived um, a um, cantankerous life. I can just look on the face of some of you and know that some of you have lived a cantankerous life. But think of this, you know, as we live our life, it seems like that a lot of people are choosing to live just like everybody else. Everybody else has this. We want to have this. It used to be called keeping up with the Joneses. But where I live, nobody's name was Jones. <laughs> so we just looked at the fancy neighborhood. And that, we looked at the fancy neighborhood, which we shouldn't have been doing to begin with, because that's covetous, covetousness. But we looked at that big fancy neighborhood, and we seem to all know that we were on the low rent district side. And we kept trying to say, man, one day, one day maybe we could work hard enough and get over. And then we had the president, we had everybody saying, the American dream, if you work hard enough, you can get it. You work hard enough and you can get one of those fancy houses. You work hard enough. And so we found ourselves trying our best to accumulate things so that we could live like everybody else. Not only just that, but party like everybody else. Hang out in the middle of the night downtown with everybody else. Maybe you didn't drink and maybe you didn't smoke and maybe you didn't chew, but maybe your neighbors do. <laughs> but the thing is, is you would try, everybody seemed to conform to the rest of this world. I think I'll skip church today and just watch the ball game. I think I'll just skip church today because it's my only day off. I think I'll choose skip church today because this ailment or that ailment or whatever because it seems like everybody has a reason to why they don't want to worship God on the Sabbath. Or what we call the Sabbath, the Resurrection Sunday. So, the Bible says don't conform to the rest of the world. Don't do it. Now, before it said, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Don't conform to the world. Number one, don't conform to the world. Say it with me. Don't conform to the world. <laughs> don't conform to the world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, see, we've got to change our way of thinking. But God can change your way of thinking. Now, can I convince you to do anything? Chances are probably not. But God, but God, He can do a radical life change to where you can completely change everything that fast. Amen. He can do it. He's got the power. But you have to surrender to His will and you have to surrender to His calling or it will just fall on your deaf ears. Amen. But be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind 
Change your way of thinking. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and what? Perfect will of God. <clears throat> and so you look at this and you're like, okay, uh, what is that good? Okay, what 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 does he want me to do? He's wanting me to do something good and acceptable and perfect. And and so I'm just it's hard for me to tell because it says the will of God. I, I can't, can't tell what the word of God, will of God is. What's the will of God? What we just read? Amen. The will of God is that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's what God wants you to do. And He does, and He wants to make sure that you don't conform to the world. That is His perfect will for your life. And that is, that is what He wants us all to do. And think of this, that is why Jesus went to the cross. Amen. So that He could be the Prince of Peace. He could offer you peace with God. And He could offer you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God in your life to give you the strength to where you can withstand from living like the rest of the world. To where you can actually live a holy life. That's what God wants. And the verse Pastor Carl uses a lot, which is, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Well, that's true, because holiness has to enter into your life. Amen. And holiness is Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen? 